Top of the Props is brought to you by Barkingham Palace Dog Grooming at Lemire. One slash ten Holiday Road Lemire, where every pup's a king or queen. Find them on Facebook, Barkingham Palace Dog Grooming, MacArthur. If you'd like to sponsor Top of the Props, contact us, the 81st Minute at Outlook.com. And we're now into episode 11 of Top of the Props. And as I was just saying to this gentleman off air as well, as a young kid growing up in the Hurstville area and going to Dragons games in the early 90s, it's always great to, to speak to, uh, great to the St. George Club. And here's another one tonight. It's Tony Priddle. Good evening, mate. How are you? How are you, buddy? Oh, um, good. I, oh, good. I, I wouldn't put myself into one of the greats, though, of the, the St. George Club. All right, but... how, about, how about this then? I, I just put on Twitter, the Dragon King of Torpedoes. <laughs> that's all right. You're, is that better? Oh, mate. Well, that's the, that, that's the thing. I actually, people still ask about the <laughs> torpedoes. So, well, that was my first question. To get it out of the way, what was the go with? Was it a sponsorship thing? Was it Brian Smith trying to think out of the box? Where did it all? Because it wasn't just you. It was about three quarters of the team at, at one point. Well, the first the first time it was a Brian Smith innovation. So he came back from an American trip and um, thought about you know, this kind of thing and minimising injuries. Yep. And the first game we wore them, it was down in Adelaide um, playing against the Broncos. Mm-hmm. And the whole team rocked out in them. Yep. So every everyone, and then it was um, a matter of, do you want to, you know, do you want to wear them afterwards? Mm. And, you know, certain people did and certain people didn't. But the thing with me was I got sponsored by the company that made them. Yeah, right. So I wore them as a part of, you know, like I got paid to wear them, which most people probably wouldn't have known. Mm. Well, you got, um, at least you got some coin out of it. Yeah, so you got some coin, got some clothing, you know, like it wasn't wasn't major back then, but it was still a little bit. And that, that was so, a, bit of, a bit of a head of its curb too, because I remember as a, as a kid around, oh, around that time, so it would have been under sevens, under eights, torpedoes were all the rage. And this is before the Daryl Halligan kicking tee, and all these other things, the torpedoes, they were the they were the they were the, the tits. If you had them on, you were cool. <laughs> well, I've done one thing cool then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got another question for you. Um, and this came up uh, just before we went on air, uh, and it was an inbox via the eighty first minute at outlook.com. And it comes from a Sharks fan. So I don't know how much memory you got from this. And it was an incident with one of the, the toughest front rowers to play in any era, Les Davidson. Now, was it yourself or Jason Stevens? You came in trying to look after Wayne Collins, who just got, I think he got KO'd by Les. Was it you or Stevens that came in second, second in, and Les turned around and went whack? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just blame Jason for that <laughs> one because I, um, either I got knocked out and don't have any memory of it, but yeah. I'm pretty sure it wasn't me. No, nah, okay, all right. That well, that that settles it. So, um, and I think Jason Stevens even mentioned on another podcast that it was uh, that, that it was he that ran in, but it was I think there's a bit of confusion. But there you go. There's your your question answered for the fan out there via the the uh, the email. Let's 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 go to the end. Let's let's talk about what you're doing now, Tony, because this is really really interesting to me. And I I took a few quotes from the the rugby league rugby league week interview you did a few years back, which then went on to the NRL.com page last year or the year before. And there was a, a few things that stood out to me. One was the under-19s game you played for the Blues at Lang Park, where you said the crowd rattled you a little bit. And then also, which we'll get to shortly, your first-grade debut against Para, And you remember, like it's yesterday, in your own words, verbatim, about a Parramatta fan giving it to you. And that stuck with you as well. So now... If you can quickly explain what you do now um, and what you do in the workforce, and does that have yeah. any correlation to some of the mer- memories you have from football and those specific well, incidents? Well, it's probably there's a, there's a, there's probably a lot that goes on behind that um, with what I do now. Okay. So I'm I'm a high performance mental skills coach. Mm-hmm. So I'm teaching people basically how to think, what to think, and why to think. And it run, it runs, you know, like runs the gamut from working with people who have anxiety and depression. Yep. Even though I, I have to state that I'm not allowed to, like I'm not allowed to say I work with that type of client mm-hmm. because I'm not university qualified. You know, like I haven't got the qualifications yep. through university to do that. 
But I'm not. I don't state that I work with mental health. I, I actually work with mental skills. So, and if you want to, and, and if in that sort of situation, mm. um, uh, anxiety or depression uh, could be classed as a skill. Yep. So if you know how the brain works, the, the it could it can be classed like that because it's we get really good at if we think about something a lot, we get really good at doing it. Mm. So, and you know, the, the, the main thoughts that you think are the main thoughts that you're going to think tomorrow. Yeah. So if, if there's ways to, um, like you can actually train your brain just like you can train your body. So, so yeah, high performance mental skills coach. Um, the, the thing about running out onto Lang Park when I was a 19 year old, mm. um, the biggest thing I can remember there was the wall of energy that came at you from the crowd when they booed you. So that was that was an interesting thing there, not related to the mental mental game, but the um, being told to go back to back to play under twenty ones in my first first grade game yep. from someone in the crowd was a bit of a was a bit of a rude awakening and a welcome welcome to um, the NRL basically. Was this something you always wanted to do? Because look, I, I guess it, it, it's a pretty Simple question from me is, is how does a front row footballer go from go from you know charging into these these psychos every weekend and that's with all due respect to because that's yeah, all we, that's all we do top of the props this is we only speak to props on the show um, but how do you go from that was it always in the back of your mind you wanted to do something um, you know with where you've turned out now was that always something you wanted to do well I've I've always had a fascination for human performance. Mm. So from the age of 14, I've virtually trained every day from the age of 14 till now. Yeah. So, and um, becoming a professional athlete was sort of like part of that journey because um, I, I was a national level rower at school. I had a choice to go to the AIS or to St. George. Mm-hmm. Um, and I picked St. George because I actually could get paid to do it. Yep. Um, and... I went to St. George. I'd already got into uni at the end of year 12 at a sports science degree in Lismore. Yep. And I, and I deferred that um, and deferred that for a year, went back to school, got a contract and then changed universities and went to um, New South Wales University um, in the, in the, at the Oatley campus, which had a sports science degree. Mm. And I completed a sports science degree while I was coming up you know, through the under-21s and, you know, getting into first grade. Mm. And, and that Lang Park game, um, from from all reports, you had a pretty good game there. You'd already played for, for country that year as well. So yep. you had a, a handful of clubs chasing you. And I, and I know the answer to this because I looked it up. But for anyone that, that doesn't know the Tony Priddle story, I think you just mentioned it there. You went to the Dragons because of, of ed- educational purposes and it was closer to, to the club? Yeah, well, it just... It, Worked out really well because um, the head conditioner at St George at the time was a lecturer at the uni that I went to. Mm-hmm. Um, an ex St George hooker, Connell Byrne, mm-hmm. um, interviewed me because I was I was a um, you know uh, I wasn't a graduating student, so I had to be interviewed to get into the uni. So there was a, there was a few little nice little coincidences there that got me into uni. That helped me get into uni. One of the, you know, our trainer, our trainer Scott Campbell was a lecturer, and Connell Byrne did the interview, and I got into that, you know. Um, so the St George connection sort of helped me get to that, hmm. and um, I got looked after really well. I got boarded, you know, like I got put into a house at, um, from one of the lecturers at the university. So you, so you weren't in that famous house where all the the out of town kids like uh, Talis and all that had to go and live in. I started out. You did. I, I spent a, I spent the first little part of. My, How was that? Uh, well, that was a welcome to Sydney. Yeah. Uh, I'm from a town of three thousand people, mm. and I rocked down. And Cecil Heron was in the same house, mm-hmm. so he was from McLean. But we had, you know, a couple of the boys there, and we lived right beside the Leagues Club. Yep. So it was. It wasn't a very very big uh, strain to go out at night and um, go down to the Down Under Bar. I don't, I don't know how many people would, would remember the Down Under Bar at St. George mm. Leagues Club. So, we, yeah, we used to be able to drop over there and we, you know, like it was a short walk home and whatnot. So, 
Um, but I only lived there for the first sort of month and a bit. Mm. Did that um, help you not and, being in that house? Um, probably yes, because yeah. I lived I lived with a family um, when I went down who who were at Oatley, mm. so where the uni was. Yep. Um, he he was the head of the primary school teaching um, section at mm. the uni, so I, I actually got to live with a really nice family and got looked after like sort of like I was at home, mm. um, and you know, just concentrated on uni and playing football. So it was it was a good start. But I don't I'd like. I mean, I was pre- I was really straight when I got to um, when I got to Sydney. Mm. So I wasn't um, I wasn't too um, I wouldn't have been too influenced okay. to you know go out and party too much or whatnot. I had I had a pretty good uh, work ethic and. And head on my shoulders, so I, you know, would stay on the straight and narrow. So you, you, you had other, like you've already mentioned, you had other sports um, which you could have gone into and, and gone down to the AIS. Did footy always come naturally to you up in McLean? Was, was was it always football, or like you said, was there other things that kept your mind off the game? And and then were you one of those guys that always thought about footy? You're in the footy crowd, or was it just show up on show up at training, show up on Saturdays, do your thing, and get out of there? Well, we, my parents lived in um, Urala, which is um, tablelands in New South Wales, and mm-hmm. uh, it was a soccer town. Yep. So, and I had two older brothers, so I actually started playing soccer when I was in the under sevens when I was four. And I played soccer until I was 12. And we moved to McLean. And rugby league was the game mm. in McLean. Like the soccer wasn't soccer was very very um, second class in McLean. Mm. So I went I went and played footy for the first time, and I made a rep side within three games. Well, wow. so it was something that um, I picked up very quickly, and yeah, just played it from that point on. So, um, but it was football in the winter. Um, Cricket till I was 14 in the summer, and then I went to rowing. So I quit cricket and did rowing from 14 to 18. So, um, and I think rowing is where the work ethic came from. Absolutely. Like, I, I can't so, even swim. So, if you can sit in a boat and do that, that's crazy. Good on you. <laughs> yeah, well, that, 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 was virtually te- that was virtually 10 Ks a day yeah, every that's crazy. day. Yeah. Um, from the age of 14 to 18, like in the summertime. Mm. Well, you- so, Sorry, mate. No, I was just going to say. So you're in you're in Sydney, and and first grade does come really really quickly. I guess there's two questions in one here. You, you mentioned in that rugby league week interview that you were expecting more from the professionalism of of this. You know, the big game in Sydney, and that's what they called it, the big game, the Winfield Cup. You get to Sydney, and I think verbatim again, you said something like it was just a big A grade comp, just on a on a on a larger scale. I mean, what was it like? You, you, you're trying to do your best. You, you want to strive to be the best player you can be. Was it frustrating as a kid? And how hard was it to speak up? You know, particularly when you got someone like you know Craig Young, who at the time was the first grade coach, who's one of the best front rowers to ever play the game, and a doyen, like an absolute god in the St George region. How hard was all that for you to take in, or were you just happy to to just you know? bite your tongue and, and get through and, and train and, and get away from the game when you could? Well, I didn't, um, I like, you wouldn't speak up. Yeah, you couldn't that wasn't really, could you? That, that's something, yeah. So as a, as a I was six foot four, mm. I weighed 90 kilos. Mm. Um, the front rowers at the time were Paul Osborne and Peter Spring. Yep. Um, so we're talking guys that were 100 and... Big you know, units. 110 to 15 kilos, yeah. yeah. And then, I'm, they, I'm, they, they, they'd I'm, already played a lot of first grade too, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, like we had guys like Shane Kelly, um, like the like the old, really old tough nut front rowers. Yep. And I'm coming in off the back of a full rowing season. Mm. I'm, you know, like 10 Ks a day. Um, aerobic capacity was my, my skill. Mm-hmm. Like I wasn't as you know, like especially when I first started, so I could get around. Like I, I could do, I could do the runs and run with the centres. Mm. 
So it was very tough for me early on because I was expecting really, really professional mm. and, um, you know, everyone to be, you know, together on your side and, you know, um, encouraging and all this kind of stuff. Mm. And I got a little bit of a rude shock when the boys started pulling me up and, you know, basically getting getting threatened to be bashed and really? stuff. Yeah, like I mean, not not as in bash bash, but no, no, we're but... going to pull you up. Yeah, we're going to we're yeah. going to sort you out if you don't if you don't stop, you know, running like this. Mm. We're gonna we're gonna sort you out, and then mm. when we go, and I'm and I'm just sitting there going, fucking hell, mm. I I'm just going to keep running. Mm. But they did sort me out. Like mm. when we got to contact drills, I can imagine short elbows. I used and, to get yeah, yeah yeah I used to get bashed, mm. and like I mean as a as a you know eighteen year old coming down from a claim. And thinking this is, you know, this is really professional. And then, but I mean, it was profe- like it wasn't as professional as it is today. But it was, you know, it was professional, right? Mm. And they're all looking after their spots. Because mm. it, so, it was a different time at St George too. It was a bit of a changing of the guard. So this is for for people out there that don't know the St George story or not Dragons fans. They had this great run up until about eighty five, eighty six, which we, uh, which I touched on with um, Pat Jarvis in a, a previous episode. And then all of a sudden, you know, they go through these these down spots. And then Craig Young, who only retired, you know, mid-80s or whatever it was, he's all of a sudden the coach. And it's a bit of a motley crew. And like you said, players holding on to, you know, the remnants of their career. They don't want to let it go. And until, I guess, Brian Smith gets there and some juniors come through, it must have been a really hard time to come down. And, and like you said, just do what you have to do and try to impress your coaches. Well, Brian Smith changed it. Yeah. Into the into what I thought it was going to be. Mm. Um, so he was very very professional, very very structured, very um, you know detail orientated. So it was that was the kind of professionalism that I was expecting when I went. Um, but it was Craig who gave me my first um, first grade jumper. Yeah. Yep. So, and, but that was. Um, it was sort of like a two guys turned up late for training. Mm. Two front rowers turned up late for training and they mm. got dropped. Mm. And that's how I got to play that um, Parramatta game. Were you were you ready for that game? Mentally, <laughs> mentally, were you ready, or was it just no? You had like, to do it? No. Yeah. Well, you just like you mean. Yeah. But yeah. Well, yes and yes and no. Mm. It was so um, scared shitless. <laughs> yeah. Like you. You know, like 19, I was, you know, like I was putting on weight, but that was, it was, it was this was six year, six months into being down there. Yeah. You know, you can't put that much weight on. So I'm probably 93, 95 kilos when I make my debut, yeah. playing in the front row. So that was. Were, were, you, yeah, sit, were was, you sitting on the bench for first then, or were you just playing 21s and then. Yeah, twenty one. Getting cleaned up and then watching Reggie's in first grade and then pissing off. What were you like? Did you have to sit on the bench for first, or was it all of a sudden bang twenty? Because what time was under twenty ones kicking off back then? Like midday, like eleven ten. Yeah, it it was just that normal three three games in a day. Yeah, the, so the good you, old so days. you got like you got five hundred people out there. One one weekend you're running out in front of five hundred people. It's still morning, and then all of a sudden, and and I assume it was a two o'clock kick off for this Sunday game against Parramatta. You've almost got twenty thousand people at Cogra, and you're starting in the front row along alongside the the likes of Osborne, um, Goulet, who was very very young as well, Fullard and Smith, Graham Wynn. I mean, that would have been a shock to the system, surely. Yeah, well, just getting getting thrown from twenty one straight to first grade. Mm. So you was... weren't so you weren't sitting on the bench. You you hadn't been getting prepared I... to play, or no, I don't. It no? was I, I I got picked in reserve grade. The first game I played was in reserve grade. Mm. Um, that was down at Canberra. Mm. And I got knocked out, and I don't remember it. Mm. And then, I, then you know, twenty the in that 21 side, we won our first 11 games straight, I think, that year. Yeah. So we were killing it. Mm. And then these guys turned up late for training, and I got pulled straight out of 21s. Um, I can't remember if I was sitting on the bench at all for anyone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
in that first year. No, no, I'm pretty sure I just played 21s. See, that's see, that's crazy to me because some of the, the – and, and the, I've spoken to blokes older than you, Tony, so I'm not saying you're an old fella, but from from what they oh, tell I'm me – I'm an old fella now. No, not, not really, mate, not really. But, look, uh, what they've told me, you know, from Pat Jarvis to Phil Daly and some of these older guys, and with respect to, the, to those guys as well, and hello if you're listening, I know they're – they're still fans and they're waiting for the next chance for for another episode. But they tell me, you know, I talk about, oh, you know, your first taste of first grade, you you come off the bench and they say, well, I can't remember that. I sat on the bench for for two years before I got a run. So it, to, to me, th- this surprises me. This is a way different back in that day to go from 21s and then bang, one one week, Craig Young says, you're starting against Parramatta at Cogger on a Sunday. So that's, it's, it's a big deal. It's, it's huge. That's a huge jump. Compared to um, you know what plays we used to back then, where they were kind of gradually introduced and got used to the systems and and you know playing later in the day and all that. Yeah, I will. Yeah, I can only tell you what happened. Mm, so yeah, I really you know like I just I was a really good trainer. Yeah, I trained my ass off, mm. and you know like so this is the kind of stuff that I think it would have. You know, put me into that, put me into a decent light, mm. and like, and I and I only played that Parramatta game, and I got picked the next week mm. and dropped, and that was the only that was my hit my first grade that year. Yeah, yeah. So that and that was really really unexpected to be picked in first grade out of that side. Mm. Um, yeah, so it was a shock. Um, I literally shit myself. <laughs> so. And I was, you know, playing against Sterlo was still playing. Yeah, yep. There were still a couple of there were still a couple of guys. I don't have the team in front of me. I only I only listed your starting pack, but I think there were a few blokes from um, the last grand final win still in the pack. Maybe Bugden was still there. Laurie was there. There were still a few names, um, and I, I think there was a, a very young Mark Horro in the team. Um, but you know, it's. Even back then, it's only a couple of years removed from their last premiership, so it's still the Eels. Um, oh, just playing against Peter Sterling, who yeah. uh, was my childhood idol. So he was your you hero. Know. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, he as, was as one a pan- of them. As a Panthers Him, fan? Kenny, all those guys. My, my dad's a para fan. Oh, so, but you were a Panthers so, fan, were you? Yeah, I, I sort of, um, they, I, I liked them because they used to beat Manly all the time. Back in the early like days, yeah, so, yeah, cool. So that was the and yeah, I just was a Panthers fan. Mm. What about what about ninety one? So we spoke about Brian Smith. So the majority of ninety one. So I, I I'm just assuming I'm I'm picturing Brian Smith in my head, and he knows he's coming to Cogger in ninety one, and I think he's coming from from Wollongong, or he might have had a bit of a break there because Graham Murray may have taken over by then, but he would have had a, a dossier on every player, I reckon, and your your best assets, what you can do better, you know, what you could improve, all this kind of stuff. In 91, you play almost the entire season in the second row, but you play 17 first-grade games. So yes. what, what was that changeover when Brian Smith got there in the off-season leading into 91? What was the message from him leading into the new season? Oh, man, I couldn't tell you what. Yeah? Or was it just still, yeah. you know, he, he was concentrating on other blokes? or, um, or But you already mentioned, though, the, the, the difference when he first got to the club. Well, the, the difference was he was just way more structured. Mm. and But detail. Like, I mean, we used to practice kickoff chases. Like, we used to set up, do a kickoff chase, go back, do another one. And... We would do that constantly and, you know, like we'd pass the ball to a circle on the fence mm. when he was there. Mm. Uh, everything was everything was really detail-orientated. I, I think um, – I just think I got my – I got a sniff of first grade in um, 1990 mm. and, you know, I went okay. I wasn't – didn't, you know, blow the roof off the stadium. Yeah. But – I think he he was looking for a different type of um, front rower. Yep. And you know the the mobile ones that can get around and not you know not the big sort of 
more rotund ones. Was he trying to? Was he also trying to cut off some dead fat from the club and and maybe another era as well? Some of the some of the egos or you know some of the hangers on from from a, a previous time at St George. That that's a question I would not know yeah, okay. how to answer because like um being a kid I was nineteen yeah and I really didn't care I just wanted to play first grade mm. so I just like, all I was doing was training and trying to get into that squad you know yeah and I was lucky enough that he sort of thought I was going to be part of that squad you know if I could hold my end up, hold my end of the bargain up mm. so. It was just that that type of situation where we can um, where it was just good timing, and I think my style or, or my body type was what he was looking for. Mm. So to mix, you know, me, Neil Teeny, Scotty Goulet, David Barnhill, different all body shapes. Similar. Oh, well, there, there yeah, were but... some different body shapes as well, right? But um, I, I guess Smith Smith has always been ahead of his time. And I think if there's one thing which is totally ironic about Brian Smith, which people say was his letdown, particularly in grand final weeks, because it, you know, it didn't become a running joke, but it became this thing that people couldn't you know, leave by the wayside. They, you, know, it, you had to look at it from years to come too. Parramatta 2001, Roosters 2010 as well. Was he too smart for his own good, if that makes sense? Like... Because he's a genius. He's an absolute football genius. And what he did with teams, Illawarra, St. George, Parramatta, uh, the Roosters in a short amount of time, I think he even um, improved the Knights while he was there as well. Um, was there too much going on in big games? And I know we're going a little bit off off the radar here and we're jumping ahead a little bit, but we're, I guess what I'm trying to say is, was there too much Brian Smith in a big week before a big game rather than leave it to the players to, to just get it done? Because he'd already done all his work before that, right? Yeah, I think... Um, well, I can only talk about the sides that I played yeah, of in. of course, of course. Um, but I think, like, I mean, and I can have an opinion, but I, if that does, is that opinion mean anything mm. sort of thing? Mm. But I think in the sides we played in, we were... I would say that we played well above our weight. Fair like, enough, I mean, yeah. for, for what people would have thought we would have done, right? Mm, mm. And that was due to consistency um, and getting the most out of everyone that played. Yeah. And I think that's what Brian Smith did well. Mm. Um, and you look at the sides that we played against in the grand final. Yeah, that's it's not really fair, is it? It, we're talking, you know, origin and test players. Oh, with, with some some of those Broncos teams were dead set Australian sides, mate. Like, yeah, that's what I'm. So we're talking about these big game guys that step up, like and can go to another level. Yep. Like it, you know. I I think Brian Smith was had the ability to get the best out of someone mm. on a consistent basis. I, I think it's one of the great chains of rugby league that uh, Brian Smith never got to win a premiership as the coach because uh, I, I think many coaches, and, and some with all due respect that have won premierships, particularly in the modern era, you know, they've got all these other coaches and, you know, all these different things and they've got, you know, the Roosters, we are talking about this a couple of weeks ago with David Chillington, the Roosters had a referees coach and all these different things. But a, a lot of what Brian Smith had to, what b- brought to the table all came from his own mind. That was all him. So... I yeah, mean, well, he, he was he was the most um, diligent mm. coach that I had. Yeah. Like, there's, you know, like, I went and... I had a year at Canterbury, but no one really knows about it. Oh, I'll get that a bit later. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, no, so that's back. all right. No, no. Well, look, I'll, I'll ask you about this. Let's jump straight in because, like, I, like we're, I'm just looking at the time as well. Um, um, let, let's talk about '92. Now, your mate from the last episode of Top of the Props, Billy Dunn. I don't know if you got a chance to listen to it, <laughs> but no, I haven't. No, you haven't. All right. So you, you finished second in '92, uh, a couple of points clear are the Broncos. In round eight, you only play once. You go down by two points. 
Now, I'm pretty sure that's the torpedo game, 20 to 18. You go to the finals, you drop the first one to the Steelers, but then you beat the Knights and then the Steelers again. Billy says that if the Steelers at the SFS that day had Ian Russell, they would have beaten you blokes. What, what do you say to that? Yeah, well, that's something we can never know because yeah. Ian Russell didn't play. But, but, but any retort to Billy Dunn? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm trying to get some controversy just... going here, Tony. Well, no, it's just one of it. Like, I mean, Billy and I got to play again, play with each other yes. at the end of our career at Burley. So yep. it was, um, uh, so that was fun. But uh, yeah, he talks about that all the time. And Does I was he? Like, all right, there you go. What? But what can you say about it? You go, okay, well, we won. Yeah, it's butterfly effect, right? So if Ian Russell plays, yeah. who says you know, you know, Michael Neal doesn't run out and slip and fall on the the co- you know on the concrete running out in the SFS and who well, knows, right? And, what what was this, was that a, was that the four two game? Uh, four nil, four nil, four nil. Hmm. Yeah, so this is what I mean. No, and it's not we, much, I, I think we and I think we beat Newcastle three two or something. Yes, yep. So um, we were playing soccer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you got to the grand final in ninety two. Um, yeah. Now I I guess at that time this was the start of the Broncos and their mighty decade of dominance in the nineties. But were the yeah. Broncos still imperious in your minds before the 92 Grand Final? Or was this still, you know, we can do this. This is absolutely ours. You know, we can we can definitely win this game. Uh, from my point, from from me, yeah. I, I, had a, I had a really bad lead into that Grand Final. Right. With lack of sleep, um, sleeping pills. Mm. Uh, so I performed... Really, really bad in that grand final. Mm. No one, no one would really know, yeah. but I felt like I had legs of concrete. Yeah. I could barely run. Yeah, what was that like so, when you're trying to stop Lazarus and you're trying to, you know, cut into their defensive line? And when you know that within yourself and you can't tell your teammates. Well, when you when you're physically wrecked before you get out there, it's not um, it's not fun. Mm. So this is and this is the difference between you know like we're talking about they. They had a team of, you know, origin players and test players. Mm. So they could lift. Yeah. I was at my capacity. Mm. Like, I couldn't go anymore. Like, I couldn't lift anymore. I actually probably went down on that grand final. Mm. So, um, and this is, so you get back to what I do now, the mental side. Yep. Purely mental. Mm. So... Yes, it is one, like, and this answers your question from earlier. Yes, this is one of the reasons I do what I do now. Mm. So because it, it, it sits with you too, and I'm sure there were, there were personal moments, flashbacks of, of that game, which I'm sure still burn you and eat you up inside. And you go, you know, if I, if I just, oh. if I wasn't like this, I could have got there or whatever. If my teammate wasn't doing this, you know, and all that. I'm sure it still eats I, I, away, yeah? Well, I, I I think I've done a good job of putting it to bed and not really thinking about it because, it, like that year, it was it was pretty harsh. I let you know, like I felt like I let myself down and my team down. Mm. But I was physically gone by the time I played the game. Yeah. I played the game all week. Um, you know, there's a whole heap of stuff that went on, uh, and I was done mm. before I even got out there. So it was very, it was it was disappointing and hard to take. I mean, you've so, done you've done pretty well. Half time six four, and then the Broncos, like you said, different levels. They go bang second half, and it ends up twenty eight yeah. eight. Um, well, Steve Steve enough runs one hundred and ten meters. Yeah, and and the, a try. And the thing that got me too is that after that ran off try from the footage, I'm pretty sure just off the top of my head, um, there was a Bronc, there was a couple of Broncos teammates there within a few seconds of him diving over the line, giving him cuddles and grabbing him on the ground. Um, how far into that game did you think, at half time, did you still think you guys were a chance? Or was it, okay, we've done really, 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 really well to get here, but in the back of your mind, you're thinking, you know, we could be in strife. I'm not, I can't, like, I mean, I honestly can't tell you what everyone yeah. thought. No, yeah, okay. But I, I would say, in my opinion, we would have been happy in... 20, um, 92 to be there. Yeah, okay. Like that was, you know, like it was sort of, we've done a good job to get here. Mm. You see it a lot. You see it a lot in grand finals, even recent grand finals. Um, the Cowboys, 
you know, uh, what year was that against the Storm? 2017, they had that, that magic run without Thurston. Um, I think Canterbury, even against South in 2014, when Burgess breaks his cheek, cheekbone, I don't think Canterbury were ever going to win that. You know, there, there, there's those games where, and hindsight's a great thing, because like you said, you, you can't get into other people's minds, but when you look back, you think, some of these teams, like, really, they've done amazingly to get there, but they'd already won their grand final the week before or the, the week before that, so... Um, that leads into 93. So you guys, there's no letdown from the year before. You guys win your first six, right? And then you go to round seven against Brisbane. At Cogra, huge crowd. You, you only lose by six. But was that was that a game at Cogra <laughs> to go 7-0 and against the defending Premier's grand final rematch? If you just got over them that weekend... Does, does that shape the rest of the year? And I know, are you going to tell me that's impossible to, to say? Because you're, way, well, smarter, you're think, way smarter than me. But was that a, was that a, was that a, could that have possibly been a turning point to go, we could go on a real roll through the middle of the season here? Well, I, like I laugh when you talk about that game because I got knocked out. Oh, there you spent, go. <laughs> uh, spent the night in hospital. Oh, shit. Well, actually, no, I actually got knocked out that game. And my brother was there and he, he's actually a paramedic. Yeah, right. Um, and no one knew I was knocked out. Yeah. So I'm I'm walking around the car park in the St. George Leagues Club trying to find my car. Oh, shit. I couldn't find my car. Yeah. I didn't drive my car. Yeah. So I've walked around the St. George Leagues Club three or four times after that game mm. um, off my tree. Yeah. Like still, don't, still didn't even realise that I played footy. Yeah. Um, so I can't. That game I can't tell you about because I was seeing stars. Mm. But you're bringing up a whole bunch of memories because, like, I mean, I never watched the 92 grand final ever Mm. because it sucked. I I bet. Absolutely. Um, I've watched the 93 grand final. Mm. But that's – but you make a good point. Like, I mean, we – 93, I think, how many games did we lose? Two or three? Yeah, like, it, like I don't have it in front of me because I've only taken down dot points. But um, the, yeah. from that year, we, like, there, I think there, we, there, I, you guys had went on winning runs a couple of times during the year, like big chunks of wins. Yeah, yeah I think we lost four games all year and one was a grand final. Mm. So 93, if you, we should have won that year. Like yeah. it was... It was our best year to win. Mm. Broncos came from fucking fifth. <laughs> yeah, they Excuse did. my French. No, no, go for it. You can fucking they shouldn't swear have as been much there. as you want, Tony. Yeah, well, they shouldn't have been there. Yeah. But they were. And, like, we we talk about big game players again. Yeah. Yeah. And, and look, again, like, uh, we talk about round 22. Now, I hope you didn't get knocked out in this one, Tony. This is QE2. The old ANZ Stadium oh, up there in yes. Brisbane. 68,000 Six, people. Oh, it's a huge number of people. Yes. And you guys get up 16-10 the week before yep. the finals. What yep. was it like coming back down? I assume it was the ANSET or the Qantas back then, whatever it was. What was the feeling like coming back to Sydney after beating the Broncos on the on the, the precipice of the finals? Well, that's what I'm – so you, this is what I'm saying. We lost If we lost four games all year, I'm, it's four or five. Well, you but only, you only played was, Brisbane once the, in, in that regular season, yeah. and you beat him in the final round. I'm pretty sure. Well, that's that's what I'm saying. It was yeah. it was a year that was spectacular until the grand final. Yep. Yeah, and, and not just um, that, Tony. You've got juniors coming through too, knocking on the door. You've got Mundine and Tallis and, yep. and Andrew Walker and and Nathan Brown. Jason Stevens is in the starting side alongside you. Um, it, it must have been a really, really good time down there at Cogra. Whether, whether it doesn't matter what group of, or, of I guess there were, the, you know, different groups of players and all the rest of it. But you know, it, it must have been a great time because those kids coming through. You got Wayne Collins, you know, starting at hooker, but you've got Nathan Brown behind him. You've got the perfect mix, and then you've got, you know, and I rate someone like Jeff Hardy. I rate Jeff Hardy so high. Because the bloke yep. could play anywhere on the football field, and he had the skills of a halfback. How good was yep. it? How good was it? Just at the back end of '93, there, when you're thinking, forget '92, we're going to win. We're going to win this. Yeah, well, so to, to put it into perspective, we that that '92 '93 run, mm. um, Mark Coyne puts on an unofficial uh, reunion every year, or he has done. 
for like up until now. Yep. That's the team that gets together the most. Yeah. So the winning culture that was created in 92 and 93 mm. has bonded a group of men like, and this is like no other team I've been involved in yep. and no other connection like that, that um, created the bond where we, you know, people come from all over Australia to go to this unofficial reunion that Mark, Mark Coyne has organised mm. virtually every year since we finished playing. So, so 92, 93, they happen. Um, look, I, really, really quickly, because I know we're, we're, we're a bit pressed for time, but have you got any thoughts on Alfie Lang as St. George can't play or the infamous tip sheet? Did you know about the tip sheet? You know, the, the, the tip sheet that Wayne Bennett, you know, the, the Wayne yes. Bennett, yeah? Yeah. Any thoughts yeah. on the tip sheet thing and all that? Was that a bit of dirty football, a bit of dirty snooker? Um, or, or, was, or was that um, you know normal for the game? Well, no. Someone um, who took it down, Ivan. I think it was Ivan Henger. Yeah, took the ninety-two sheet down. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what I've heard. No, he took the sheet down, and Wayne whited shit out and changed the stuff on it. Mm. So that's, that's pretty is, shit. Is, these are the rumours. Yeah, but I mean, it's a professional sport. Yeah. What do you like? I mean, that's just coaching, right? Yeah. So he, he, you know, Wayne Bennett's been the king of knowing how to get the best out of his players, right? Yeah, that's right, exactly. So he put, um, you know, the St. George can't play stuff was he, he whited something out and put um, such and such can't play. I don't know who it was, mm. but that's where the Saints can't play stuff came from. Mm. Um, and. But, like, I mean, uh, so you talk about integrity of the bloke you gave the thing to him, but, I mean, it's professional sport. Yeah. Yep. So I don't, have a, I don't have a problem with any of that kind of stuff. It's, uh, it was probably clever, clever coaching. Yeah. Let's um let's jump a, jump ahead a little bit because Super League is is lurking and it, it's not just lurking at this point it's you know you guys are probably talking about it at St George Leagues you you know you you're getting whispers from managers and everyone else that wants to talk about it in the ground before a game and all the rest. Uh, Gordy Tallis talks about it in Raging Bull. Now he says um, just before it all hits the fan, Jeff Carr, who has big ties to St George and obviously. Uh, even bigger ties to the then New South Wales Rugby League, which would become the ARL. Is it true yep. that, that Jeff walked in, sat the entire squad down, and tried to get you all to sign a contract there and there in the in a Chinese restaurant around the corner from the ground? Is is that all correct? And and some of you said no, or well, it was it wasn't correct for me because St George were trying to get rid of me at the time. Really? Yeah. So I didn't get that. I wasn't in that click and didn't get that offer. Mm. So um, it may have happened, but I wasn't involved. So why is I that? Was, because you, you, you've, oh. you'd given your guts for, for you know, you, you came out of nowhere, you, you play your first full season in the second row, then you go into the front row, and for three years there, you play something like 60-odd games, and then they don't want you. Why, why was that really quickly? Well, what, what, what happened Well, I, got it. I, I, put, I actually played 100. A hundred? No, no, okay. I apologize. I apologize. No, 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 I, no. I, I, I just meant, I just meant through that two, hundred games of them. Just that two or three yeah, year was, period um, where you, you came along at the start. You, you know, you there's a couple of big years to start off with, and I, I just don't understand why the club would turn around in ninety four, ninety five, and try to get you out of there. Well, business because I wasn't playing, and like I wasn't doing what Brian Smith wanted me to do. Yeah, okay. So it was business. Um, mm. I went. I was trying to get out of the club. Like yep. I, I got, I got an offer from South that was three times what my St George offer was mm. before Super League came in. Yeah, and I'm number. I went from number one front rower or number two front rower to number six front rower. Mm. Um, and then Brian, Brian, and I had a, you know, I was on the outer at that point in time. Yeah, which you you were hoping you weren't the player that was on the outer. Yep. I, w I was the one at that time, and then, um, well, Super League came in. I signed a contract and got straight back into first grade the next week. Mm. 
Yeah, funny so that. because because I just didn't care anymore. Mm. So, um, but yeah, no that that meeting may have happened, but I I didn't sign. Um, I I signed the Super League. So, so just for a record for everyone, and I've got it in front of me, Tony, 103 first grade games. I, I just meant those 60 in the first couple, <laughs> those first couple of years. That's what that's what I was trying to get at. That that you, yeah, yeah, you're giving no, your no, ass that's... for those first few years. But you're at training. I think you even mentioned that you were playing ARL versus Super League touch games, yeah, that, and you're on one yeah, side we... with Gordy and Mundine. Yeah, was that weird? No, well, that, the boys just went. Well, this is what this is what's happening now. So we used to just play ARL and Super League games. Yeah, of touch. But I I did an ACL in '95, so mm. so I um, I got picked in first grade. Finally worked my way back into first grade. Mm. Um, I think I think that week I did an ACL and I was gone. Mm. So that was my last, you know, like St George. That was the end of my St George career. Did that Did that hurt? Yeah, yeah. because I know when you came to Sydney, you weren't a you weren't a you know, die on the wall St. George fan. You, you, you came there for different reasons. You came here to play first grade footy, but did it hurt when you knew you were done at Cogra and you're probably coming off the field, you're thinking, I'm done here. Was it Was it a shit way to go out? Uh, well, um... For yourself, for yourself. Yeah, well, if you understand, like, I mean, yeah, it was, it was pretty shit at the time, but you can you sort of sit back now and go, well, that was the business of the, of the sport. Yeah. Um... If I knew what I knew, if I, you know, like hindsight's a great thing, but if I knew what I knew now, I wouldn't have been at St. George. Um, I wouldn't have re-signed after my fourth year. Mm. So what, so was, your, been, what, what was, was your fourth year? Was that 92, 93? Yep. So, so, so 90, 91 was my first contract. 92, 93 was my second contract. Um, I should have went out and just got bigger money from somewhere else. Yeah. Because to be honest, they don't really give a shit about you. Mm. Like, I, I, um... Just the conveyor you know, belt, had, isn't it? I, hey? Just the conveyor belt. Yeah, well, it's, you're, it's a meat market. Mm. Like, in, like, I mean, I don't... That's just the way the game is. Mm. And, like, I was... I was on the out, I did my knee, and that was... I was done. Mm. At St. George. Um, I had three games at Canterbury, did the ACL again, and that was my NRL career. Mm. It was gone. Can you can you tell so us? I, can you tell us about your your? Did you did you have a one on one with Lachlan, Lachlan Murdoch or was that was that a bit like? Because um, I know again referencing back to Gordon Tallis's book because you know it, it it makes sense talking about you know the, the same kind of timeline where, where they were down at Phillips Street and there were blokes sitting down in the hallway and all the rest of it. Were you across at Foxtel with Lachlan Murdoch? What was that? Yeah. Was that meeting like? What, what was it like sitting down with Lachlan Murdoch? I walked out with a 50 grand check in my hand. Yeah. That's so, all right, isn't it? Well, yes and no. Yeah. Like, I mean, I got railroaded into that with a manager that I had, you know, who came on board. Um, and then, like, like and again, hindsight's a great thing. I I should have went from that off. I went back to the ARL and said, well, they've offered me this. The NRL would have offered me that. Mm. And came back to Super League and got, you know, double what I got or triple what I got. Mm. Because I mean, you know, like I'm, see, I'd compare myself with Jason Stevens, like in those, in that time. Yeah, like, absolutely. So I would have, I, I, you know, like he's talking six to $800,000, I think it was. Mm. Um, I should have, I should have been on four to five. Mm. And considering he broke yeah. a thumb a minute into the 93 grand final, and that's probably what he's known for in the early 90s, was, you know, coming off with a, a thumb sticking out of the side of his hand. So, uh, I think... Oh, he, would, he, he could play. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, like, yeah, I'd love to get him on the show, but, you know you know what I mean? Like, you were doing as much as Jason Stevens in those Dragon sides that went back-to-back grand finals. Yeah, it was, it was just a shame that it wasn't 94, 95 or a back-to-back grand final. Yeah. Then. <laughs> <laughs> it, would have been, it would have been better timing. Um, I'm just looking yeah, at the time, Tony. Been... Look, I know we've only got four minutes left, so I, I want to ask you, because I do like to ask this as well, um, if you could really quickly, if you could, looking back on your career, give me your three toughest front rowers to play against. Um, and for different reasons, it doesn't have to be you know, the, the blokes we probably expected to be, but from your own personal perspective on the field, you know, you got 10 minutes to go at Cogger at 16 all. 
and this mad bastard's running at you, or someone that you just couldn't tackle, or give us three of your well, toughest opponents you ever played against, if you can, off the top okay. of your head. Okay. So, playing in under 21, I played against a bloke called Kyle White. Yeah. Remember Kyle? Did he play for the Magpies? No, he was playing at Canterbury at the time. Okay. He's got a brother as well, and, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, just right. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, so Kyle, um, I got hit by Kyle one day and I thought my teeth fell out. Really? Yeah, I thought my teeth were going to fall out into my mouth gut. <laughs> so that, um, and that was in under 20 months. Yeah. And, I, and we just had this running battle all day. And I thought I was tough, but he knocked the shit out of me. So I literally thought my teeth, I thought my teeth had fallen out. So yeah, that's right. how bad that was. Um, so he was, and he taught me a really, really good lesson. Yeah. Not to run at the best hitters in the game. <laughs> Fair enough. So I learned that lesson and I learned to move, um, you know, you know, final final step so I didn't get yeah. hit well, like that, that that's again. That's what the good right? front rowers do, though. They develop that into their, their skill because I've, apart from Martin Lang, who is a legend in his own right, I've, apart from him, the best props I've ever seen don't run straight. They, they've got an arc or they've they've got lines that they run and they get between plays. And another, yeah, well, and like I, I, I didn't bring this up before, Tony, and I want to squeeze this in because I, I did post on the 81st Minute Twitter page that I was interviewing you tonight and there was a Sharks fan that said that Tony Priddle had a, a great arcing run that could get to the outside of a player, drag two in, and then get an offload away. That that's genius. That's that's not running. That's genius. That's developing the game, right? That's developing your skills as a front rower. Yes. So that so that that game in the under twenty one taught me a big big lesson. Right? Mm, mm. But you talk about front rowers. Like um, the era I got to play in, like I got to play against Blocker, yep, um, Lazarus, mm-hmm. um, Fennec, <laughs> yeah, at the Bears, yep. So we're talking. Um, there was a lot of good front rowers. Would you class Ian Roberts time. as a uh, second rower or a prop? Well, he was. He was. He played prop. Yeah. So Roberts, um, Harrigan, yeah, Sergeant, yep. You really like. I mean, you talk about those guys. Um, I mean, every I'm week was a challenge, I'm, right? Well, I'm sitting here talking. I'm sitting here going, uh, "Yeah, well, I got to play against those guys, so mm. I couldn't really tell you one who was hard. They were all hard. So just think about that. Like, I got you know, I was at the end of their career, or well, as I know, but I, most of them the end of their careers. Mm. So. That was pretty cool to be able to play against those kind of guys and you know match it. And they were all different front rowers too. And I think, and, and, and again, I'm looking at the time, Tony, so we'll, we'll pull this up in a sec. But I mentioned this with Steve Jackson a few weeks ago on top of the props about... Yeah, week, well, he was another one. There you go. Like week to week, like it didn't matter if you were playing the Seagulls or if you were playing, you know, 95, the Crushers, or it doesn't matter where you were playing. They were all, whether they were at the back end of their career or they were a young bloke trying to make a name in the game. There were different skills, and, and you always had to keep an eye out because you had to always bet out the bloke in front of you. Yeah, it was... So, so to give you... The, the, the only one I can really remember who did something that really, really hurt me was Kyle White. Yeah, okay. It was, like, it was literally like running into a brick wall. Mm-hmm. And then that was the last time I ever tried to do that sort of stuff. So, um, but I think everything was just a—it was a contest. Yeah. Yep. And you just try, and you just did your best in that contest. So you know, like, I don't think they anyone stood out as being oh Newcastle probably Newcastle at Newcastle if you're gonna mm. with with Sergeant and Harrigan. Yeah, was Butterfield there as well? In their prime. Yeah, Butterfield was there. Yeah. Oh, they, but they're in their prime, they were probably the biggest, hardest pack mm. that we had to deal with. And then the, the, the Kiwi captain, Stuart, back in the day as well. And, yep. Yeah, Glanville. So they're, yeah. They're talking, so they're talking about, they were probably the, 
that was probably the most intimidating. But I can't I can't ever remember being intimidated. I just had internal conflict, as in my own self worth or mm. that that type of stuff. You know, like um. Just the general doubts that most people have about themselves. Well, that 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 makes you run harder and, and run in the gaps harder and try to get you play the balls and, and tackle is, is fear. That that's that's yeah, what... that, well, my, my more nervousness for me. Yeah, okay. Like I didn't re- I didn't really fear going on the field or mm. you know playing playing the sport, but mm. you know letting people down or that type of thing. Mm. More more self um, self worth type stuff. Well, Tony, I, I want to thank you very much for, for giving up your time tonight. I know you've got better things to do. You said you're at a mate's house tonight. So enjoy the football. Um, this will be available. By the time people are listening to this, it will already be available. So I shouldn't even be saying that. But we'll get you back on, Tony. Like I say to everyone else, you're always welcome back on. And it sounds like we've got plenty of other things to talk about in the game because you're clearly a very bright man with plenty of things going on. And I want to thank you again for being on top of the props, Tony. It's been a pleasure. No problem, buddy. I was, it was enjoying having the chat. <laughs> Good on you, mate. Cheers. And 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 we reminiscing about some of those memories that I've even forgotten about. No, that's it. And there's more to talk about, so we'll get you back on. All right. Sure, that'd be great.